Welcome to the Rewilded Human Podcast, where Dr. Lucille and Lynn will tackle your most difficult and intimate questions with candor, tough love, and a little dash of humor. In today's episode... Your breasts are actually a source of orgasmic pleasure. If you learn how to stimulate your breasts in just the right way, you are going to um, get an orgasm. It's good to realize that that sometimes that's not enough. And, I, and what you're saying is exactly right. That even if you're doing all the right things, going out to all the right places, until you're in the right mindset, you're not going to attract the right person. You know, you do the things that you need to do. You get the kids to school. You get to, you know, you get your parents into an old folks home. You pay off your mortgage. You, you know, you're doing, doing, doing all these perfunctory tasks. And you've never prioritized having time together. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 41 of the Rewilded Human Podcast. I'm Lynn Hardy, and I'm here with my beautiful co-host, Dr. Lucille, where we answer your most intimate questions and we help you rewild back to your true self. And we've got an amazing set of questions for you guys today. So we're going to jump right in. Hi, ladies. Ever since I was a teenager, I wanted to have a bit of a bust. I used to have such low self-esteem because of it. I saw a few doctors and was put on birth control, but it did nothing for me. So after a while, I stopped taking it. Then I started wearing mastectomy bras, but I felt like a liar. Then I went for fat transfer and I got infected in pain with lots of visits to the breast clinic, lots of necrosis areas. It was a bummer, zero increase. And now I've got these tiny random bumps. I'm 42 and this still bothers me about myself. I was thinking of getting small breast implants. I don't want anything big at all or to try the fat transfer again, but your post came on my feed and I thought of connecting with you. What would you advise? Thanks from Mary. So Mary, thank you so much for your question. And this was something that was sent to me personally. It was a DM on Instagram when I posted about my troubles with having a breast implant removed and all this it's a long story. I will share it with you guys another time. So it's very painful for me to read this, Mary, and to hear your story. And my heart goes out to you so much that for all that you've been through. And I, I really, really understand what you're going through. It's, it's really hard for me to give you advice and tell you exactly what to do. But honestly, if I was you, I would, I would not do anything. I would not do the fat transfer again after what you've been through. I definitely would not go back to the implants knowing what I know now. I would not risk my health in any way at all. And the only thing that I can really offer you is um, with Dr. Lucille's help, and she's, she's the expert in this, is to learn, help you to learn to accept yourself as you are and to love yourself as you are. Um, I've had I have to do a lot of inner work to learn to love myself with my small breasts compared to you know the large implants that I had. You know I, I I felt like I would not be a woman anymore if I had them removed, and so it was a lot of work that I need to do on myself to learn to live with and to learn to love them. And I think I needed to, if I would have been left with the small boobs from the beginning, I would have probably hated them forever. But having the bigger boobs and hating what I had to go through, the hell that the implants put me through or almost killed me. And now having my small natural boobs back, I appreciate them so much. It's like when you lose a lover and then you get them back and then you love them again. It's kind of that story. So I, I really wish for you at 42 to also start to learn to love yourself again and to stay away from these procedures because they just don't end well. Lucille, what do you think? I, uh, you know, you are the expert on this tortured journey that women can go on with regard to breast implants, et cetera. I don't know how you went through it, Lynn. I listened to your story and I'm, I'm just aghast. I cannot believe that p people go through that. So you are definitely the expert uh, on the whole journey itself. One thing I would suggest, Mary, is, um, you know, therapy is excellent. Uh, it's an excellent option to do before you consider doing anything else right now, uh, you may want to, you know, get into really understanding why this one area of your body is such a sticking point for you. And 
you may have no idea like where it leads back to, it, you know, you may have something in your past that's kind of buried in your unconscious uh, that is triggering all this negativity about your breasts. And sometimes when people get to what it is that they hate about that body part, whatever it may be, and it's not always breasts, sometimes it gives them a huge aha. And then they're ready to start healing from the old wounding they had about that part of their body. They're not quite so keen on surgical modification or anything else. It's amazing how it can be very healing to get to the root story of why you learn to hate your breasts. Yes, absolutely. And then once you get to that point, I agree totally with Lynn that the next piece is to really work on to appreciate, to really appreciate every part of you and how miraculous it is. Small breasts, large breasts, they're yeah. still miraculous. Yeah. Right? And to send and to send your body, you know, like there's this ritual where every night you send like certain body parts love. And so you can right. send love and nurturing and healing to your breasts as well. And I think that's beautiful. You know, like when I look at mine now, I just, I, you know, and even though there's scars and, and they're small and everything, and I just, I just send them so much love and appreciation for, for still being with me. Lucille, now you work with the Healy, an energy device. And, you know, I work with energy devices as well. And right. this new one that I'm testing right now, they also have a program for enlarging your breasts. Does mm -hmm. Healy have this? And can you do this with uh, like energy medicine? You can certainly do it with energy medicine. But the other thing that's really interesting is you can do it with through breast massage. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of radical. But, you know, for the people who are into things like tantric practices, mm -hmm. which is a specific kind of sexual practice, there is a lot of body self-stimulation that goes on with that. And one way to heal your relationship with certain parts of your body is to touch, to touch. And the breasts, people don't understand this uh, or, or really know about it a lot in uh, the Western culture, but your breasts are actually a source of orgasmic pleasure. If you learn how to stimulate your breasts in just the right way, you are going to um, get an orgasm. Now, it won't necessarily happen the first or second or third time you try it, but over time, you can make your breasts extremely sensitive. And the more stimulation you give to the breasts, the larger they'll become. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that uh, your breasts, um, uh, are uh, they are connected energetically to every single part of your body. And so when all of your body is, when you're happy and healthy and, uh, and there's energy flowing beautifully throughout your body, your breasts will also do better, right? If you're giving us, and as Lynn says, if you're giving your breasts love, that gets transmitted. That's an energetic transmission. Now, uh, with the Healy, I don't think they have anything that I've run across that is about, um, uh, you specifically enlarging your breasts, but they do have a coach module and you can use that coach module to uh, input energies that are specific to some desire you have. So hmm. you input the Healy, the statement, I'm so happy and grateful that I have beautiful, healthy, oh, uh, luscious. <laughs> breasts. Oh, luscious. Voluptuous. Luscious, luscious breasts. <laughs> And you input that and the healing will actually then scan you for the frequencies that you're lacking that you would need oh. to manifest that desire. And then it would transmit those frequencies to you. You can you can certainly do that with the Healy. I don't know about your device, Lynn. It, mm -hmm. So it has. Have you tried the program on yourself? Your I device? haven't yet because you know I'm, I'm just sending them so much love that they're growing just during this yes, podcast. Exactly. Like they're I'm bursting out of this dress right right now. So right. I haven't tried it yet. I just feel like there's more important programs on there that I yes, need to, exactly. that I yes. need to test first. Yes. Yes. I'm not mentioning my device I, unless they start sponsoring our show, then I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe hypnosis. Hypnosis could work as well. I've heard about hypnosis. Yeah, but, you know, I like to go for the stuff that's direct, like, you know, just yeah. touch, touching your breasts. Start I like feeling that. Pleasure, start feeling pleasure from your breasts. Stimulate your nipples. Yeah. Uh, and, and do breast massage. Regular breast massage is 
helpful in so many ways because you want to drain the lymph from that area to prevent things like a breast cancer, et cetera. Uh, so it's a good practice to do at least once or twice a day where you're just massaging your breasts. And YouTube has, you know, um, a number of uh, ways to massage your breasts. You be be careful what that. you're searching for on Google, though you might get some interesting, interesting video. Yes, something very interesting that you had. Yeah. Uh, How to massage of. breasts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I would just say, get like, get personally involved with your breasts, you know, yeah. give them love as Lynn says and massage them, touch them, yeah. start yeah. developing a real relationship with them. And you may be surprised by what happens to your breasts. How they respond. And also she's 42. So, you know, I, I've heard a lot of ladies say that after menopause, their breasts got bigger. So that's also a possibility. Yeah. It's a possibility, yes, absolutely, and um, it obviously it doesn't happen to everyone. But there's always hope, right? Oh, there's <laughs> always hope. Remember that in mainstream medicine, there's a lot they don't know. There is so much in ancient wisdom and ancient healing traditions mm -hmm. uh, about breasts and breast health that the mainstream medical model just has no idea about. Yeah. So if I, I were you, I would I would go to um, a more traditional approach for for breast health but you know it's up to you ultimately right yeah but ultimately it's to it's to learn to accept and love yourself absolutely i think that's absolutely. the biggest that's the biggest lesson here so mary we hope that you find this helpful and please let let us know right back to me and let me know what you decide to do yes that would be wonderful okay so we're on to our next question dear lynn and dr lucille I have been through a lot since my divorce. My family and friends don't seem to understand and I often feel isolated and lonely. I left a long-term marriage due to emotional and verbal abuse and now I'm struggling to find meaningful connections. Despite being active in the gym, yoga, choir, and church, the men I meet are either elderly, gay, or married. At 54, I still long for physical intimacy and companionship. How can I find a loving, kind person who shares my outlook on life and is awake in this crazy world? What steps can I take to rebuild my social life and create new, fulfilling relationships after such a long marriage? Any advice for overcoming the sense of isolation and moving forward would be deeply appreciated. Yours, Annie. Uh, well, Annie, uh, this is a very, very common issue that women uh, of your age and experience have. Divorce rates um, have really gone up, especially in the older age groups, you know, people who've been married for long periods of time, and then they're on their own again. Uh, and so I have a lot of compassion for that feeling of isolation and loneliness that you're experiencing. And you know, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture this is a challenging experience and unfortunately i don't think people are really prepared for how much of a journey this is to try to find another soulmate it is it is very very challenging which does not mean that you should just give up but it's about not just having the goal of finding the man of your dreams, but also to develop yourself on the journey. The journey is as important, if not more important, than actually getting to the goal of finding the man. Uh, because you, you are ne of necessity needing to learn a lot about yourself Remember, you've been in one relationship for quite some time and you know yourself in the context of how you behaved in that relationship, but you don't necessarily know how you're going to behave in the context of other relationships or just in dating men you never met before or maybe met over you know, a phone conversation. Yeah. So part of the journey is really to, if you, if your goal is, you know what, yes, I want to find the man of my dreams, but I also want to up-level myself. I want to develop myself. I want to learn more about myself. I want to develop a more fulfilling life, whether I have a man in it or not. Then you are much, much more likely to succeed at either finding the man of your dreams 
or saying to yourself, you know what, I'd be happy single too, because I've just developed such a rich and rewarding life on my own. Mm -hmm. And whether man arrives or not, that would, you know, that's perfectly fine with me. I'm confident that I could have a very wonderful life on my own. Uh, and in fact, I have a number of clients who started out this way where they were really desperate to, you know, find the man of their dreams. And they were on uh, Tinder and um, all the other, I can't even remember all the <laughs> dating sites that they were yeah. on. I learned so much about dating sites. And they worked and they worked and they worked and they they did learn so many things about themselves and about men and about how to approach relationships. And then after a while, they realized that, you know, I've developed myself so much and I've developed so many interests. I'm much more relaxed. I, I'm fine being on my own. I, you know, I'm not all that desperate any longer to be with a man. And it's that state of desperation, a sense of lack in your life that attracts a certain experience, unfortunately, it kind of um, expands on that feeling of lack. Okay, the more you're thinking, I need, I need, I need, I'm a I'm man. Yeah. The more you're going to attract something into your life that reflects back to you that you're lacking, that there's something missing. Every yeah. man will come, there'll be something wrong, or they, they will, uh, you will have, you know, you will be with them too long after a point at which you notice that, they're not giving as much as you are or something's not quite there. Yeah. Okay. So you want to be seeing this as a long-term journey in which you will definitely succeed at improving your life, no matter whether you find Mr. Right or you don't. But the more you up-level yourself, the more likely it is you will find Mr. Right. Yeah. So... I don't know how that sits with you, Annie, but that's certainly been my experience working with a lot of women who are in your position. Oh, so I'm, really glad, no, I'm, I'm really glad you said that, Lucy, because I've been chatting with her back and forth. And I know that she's quite upset because of the way her family and friends are treating her for getting out of her relationship and for leaving the marriage. So she's getting a lot of slack for that. You know, it's not like people are celebrating her or helping her. They are making it more difficult for her. And also, you know, our normal advice would be like to join a gym, yoga, choir, church, all sure. those places where you will meet your man. And, and it's not it's not working for her. So it's good to realize that that sometimes that's not enough. And, I, and what you're saying is exactly right, that even if you're doing all the right things, going out to all the right places until you're in the right mindset, you're not going to attract the right person. You're right. just going to keep, it's like you're banging your head against the wall until the work on yourself is done. And that, yes. I think that is, that is such a crucial, I mean, you nailed it. That's mm -hmm. absolutely spot on. And, and right. yeah, and also not putting so much emphasis that I need to have a man, you know, I'm like you said, I'm okay on my own. I'm happy. I'm great. If somebody comes, it's not like they're going to complete me because I'm complete myself, but you right. know, they're going to compliment me and compliment my life. And there's a big difference. Right. right. And and if you can, I would suggest that you stop talking to your family and friends about your uh, dating process. <laughs> you just yeah. don't want them involved. I mean, if, yeah, uh, draw a boundary on that because that their energy will only bring you down. Yeah, that is true. I agree with that. Annie, uh, write back to me and write back to us and let us know how you're doing because we really want to know. And we're on to the next question. Hi, guys. I'm feeling incredibly overwhelmed as I'm trying to balance caring for my aging mother while also raising two teenagers. It feels like I never have any time for myself and I'm constantly exhausted. What are some strategies or resources that can help me manage these responsibilities more effectively without burning out? Thanks, Jane. Jane, thank you very much for your question. And, you know, you are what they now call the sandwich generation, which is a term that I just recently came across. I've never heard this before, and it makes a lot of sense. And this is happening across the board right now. You know, people are having children later on in life. So when, you know, we are in our 40s, 50s, normally we would have had grown children by now, but a lot of pe people are having just small children at the moment, but also elderly 
and ailing parents. So you're kind of stuck between the two, right? And it's a very, very difficult situation to be in because your children demand all your time and attention, but so do your parents when when they're not well and elderly and they need to be taken care of. So it's it's I think this has never happened before in human history where you know the age gap is has changed so much and that we don't have this sense of community and family around us supporting us. You know, normally you would have like when I had my my son was young, he's almost 27 now when he was young, my parents were still young. They were in their 40s. You know, I had the grandparents all the time helping me, taking care of him. We could travel. So, you know, it was a lot of help for me. But if my parents would have been in their 70s or 80s, that help would not have existed. So Jane is missing out on that aspect from her parents. And at the mm -hmm. same time, she's being torn between taking care of children and taking care of the parents. So it's a very, very, very difficult situation to be in. Lucille, what, what what would you advise to her? Like what what how can you juggle all of these things together? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just a question. I she doesn't mention Jane, you don't mention a husband in picture. So I'm not yeah. sure if you're a single parent doing all of this. Uh in yeah. which case I have no idea how you do it. But I agree with Lynn that the first thing you need is some kind of community or support. You will definitely burn out if you do this on your own. So if the, and if you don't have siblings or any other family members that can step in and help out, uh, then you have to rely on the kindness of strangers, so to speak. And I would start by doing the easiest thing, which is looking for community. You can look for community online. Uh, there are Facebook groups uh, for people who are in the sandwich generation, and you can pick up tips and strategies and you know get emotional support in those groups uh, and also people share resources so they will refer one another to you know um, uh, services or whatever whatever is needed uh, and they can be really invaluable uh, when you know you're struggling as you are sort of on your own uh, and also uh, you know in your own community I'm sure that you're not the only one who's dealing with this and I don't know what social services you have available, uh, but for example, with um, parents, elderly parents in a lot of uh, areas, they there are uh, government usually government sponsored um, uh, agencies, uh, social work agencies, etc., that will come into uh, the home and they will assess uh, the needs your parents might have. And uh, they might suggest programs, they might suggest people to come into the home to help out. Uh, so if there's anything like that in your community that you can turn to, I would strongly encourage that at least you get a consultation. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, Or if she has brothers yeah. and sisters, she doesn't mention uh, that, but if she has siblings... You know, yes, because I, I see this happening where it's like everything is on one person and they have siblings yeah. who do nothing or they don't live close by, but they should be at least contributing financially or something so they can, you can hire someone that comes in once or twice a week. I mean, it's it's really hard to juggle all of these things by yourself. Yes, exactly. And and some of the geriatric services will offer that too, or they'll get the family together mm -hmm. and they will facilitate a meeting uh, to try to, you know, get if, if it's a little bit difficult for, you know, the siblings and you to agree on certain things that they will help to mediate and they will oh, really? uh, offer suggestions, etc. So that that's in some areas, it's not yeah. necessarily available everywhere. You know, if you have anything like that, um, you know, it, you absolutely take advantage of it. Absolutely. What what should be the priority, the children or the parents? That's a good one. It depends on where they're they're at because you know you may have two teenagers and both of them have ADD. Oh my God, I can't imagine life with with yeah. two ADD teenagers. And they may need tremendous amount of help, or they may have some kind of learning disability or whatever needs they have. You know, it, it really varies. Whereas your elderly parents may be needing support, but they're still stable enough that they can live on their own in yeah. their own home you ju they just need somebody to check on them so 
it, you know, or it can be reversed where the teens are very independent and high functioning and you don't need to give them necessarily as much care, but the elderly parents are yeah. declining quite a bit. So each each situation will be a little bit different and you'll have to kind of assess your own situation and see what's the priority. Yeah. And maybe um, if the teenagers are old enough and mature enough, maybe they can also help with the parents. Yeah, and that that's a really good, that's a really good lesson, I think. I, I see that with my with yes. my husband's cousin happening and my cousin's looking after her mother 24/7, which is a really difficult thing, but she has a 15-year-old daughter who also helps her. And I think right. that's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I know it's hard, but I think it's really important for the children to also learn this so that sure. they have the skills and everything when they need to take care of you down the line. So um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessary. I don't think you necessarily have to shelter, especially teenagers from this and from the responsibility. Surely they can go and do a bit of shopping or just sit with grandma on the side of the bed and, you know, tell her stories or look after her a little yeah. bit. So I think I think engage the children as well if you can. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jane, so much for your question. Yeah. We hope um, we hope our tips help and we understand that it's a right. very difficult situation and um, we wish you yeah. definitely all the best. Yes. Um, and let's let's hope you never, ever get even close to burnout. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. make sure you, you know, self-care is also important. So you have to do you have to look up after yourself as well. That's right. We always we, we always have to get, remind you guys of that. But yeah, self-care is also super important. OK, mm -hmm. so let's see the next question. My partner and I have been together for over 20 years, and while we still love each other deeply, it feels like the spark has faded. We've tried a few things to reignite our passion, but nothing seems to stick. Do you ladies have any tips for bringing back that spark we had in the beginning? Thank you from Mark. Well, thanks very much for this question, Mark, because I hear a lot of this sort of thing from female clients, and it's really refreshing to hear a man talk about it. I think it's really great that uh, that you are interested in reigniting the spark between you and your partner. Now, the interesting thing about this issue is you have to start with the emotional intimacy first. I know people will go to those sex stores and get the props and the, you know, in the vibrators and all that, you know, all that stuff and think that's going to do it. It won't it gets boring after a while because it's not so much your technique. It's not, uh, you know, the thousand and one ways that you learn how to stimulate the vagina. It's not any of that. The real charisma, the real spark comes from the heart to heart connection. It's when you see your partner come through the door and your heart skips a beat and you're so so glad to see them and and that only comes from getting to who the two of you really are now at this time of your life what are your dreams what are your passions what are your hopes who are you you know it's so easy for people to just kind of drift along in a marriage and, you know, you do the things that you need to do. You get the kids to school. You get to, you know, you get your parents into an old folks home. You pay off your mortgage. You, you know, you're doing, doing, doing all these perfunctory tasks. And you've never prioritized having time together. You may not have had dates. You have maybe not taken time away from your family obligations to maybe just sit and have a coffee somewhere and say, how are you, hon? Like, what's been going on for you? What are your vulnerabilities? What have been the great things that have happened? You know, it is that emotional bond that ultimately reignites the spark. And it will be different now than it was when you first met because you're both different. You've had a lot of experience with one another. You've taken each other for granted. Yes, we all do that. And so now it's about going on a date of exploration with your partner as if you're meeting for the first time. And you want to be able to open up your hearts, 
safely and in a trusting manner to one another and say, you know, these are the things that now light me up in my life. These are the dreams I have for us. Uh, I want us to go back to having those romantic candlelight dinners, just the two of us. I want us to be able to have those intimate times of pillow talk you know, before or after intimacy. I'd like, I'd love us to go on a journey somewhere to, you know, on a, an African safari, whatever, so that we can have adventures with one another. You want to open up really learning who this person is as if you are dating for the first time. And you may be surprised by what you learn about your partner. And she may be very surprised by what she learns about you. I'm sorry, I assume you're a male, female couple, but I could be wrong. Pardon me if I've, uh, if I've misrepresented that. But the truth of it is that we can't, we can't sustain deep, loving relationships on a superficial level. Mm -hmm. It just goes flat after a while. It's kind of like having robotic routine sex. But if you have a really alive and passionate love for each other, the sex will come naturally. Yeah. Yeah, you need you need that emotional connection first. Absolutely. And I think it's yeah. really important for both men and women. Absolutely. That or, we, or you know, we need it different. It, men and women need it differently, but also uh, every man will need a different form of emotional intimacy. Every woman will need a slightly different form of emotional intimacy. So it really is about the learning about one another all over again. Yeah, I, I agree. Dr. Dr. John Deloney says something always. He says to couples, you know, like to ask your wife in the morning, how can I love you today? Yeah. And isn't that nice? I love that. You know, that's just, you know, that's just such a deep, it opens it up for like such a deep connection. Like, how can I love you? What can I do to love you today? Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing. And actually, you know, I was away on vacation um, last week and um, you know, things were also a little bit, you know, I'm al almost 30 years with my husband and things got a bit stagnant. He, he has Asperger's. So he, he tends to pull away a lot. And as he's getting older, he's pulling away more. And um, I had this idea come to me. It was a really strong idea. And um, let me know what you think about this, Lucille. And, and also for Mark, maybe this something like this would work. And it almost like came to me in a dream, but like a daydream. And I wrote to him and I said, by the time I come home, please write these things for me. I would like you to write down five things that you would like from me and from us. That you would like, you know, that you see that you would like from either from me as a person or for us, like, you know, more time together or more, whatever. And I would also like to know where you see us in five years and where you see us in 10 years, you know, because I think it's really important to plan together and to plan the future together. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and to really ask the person what, what it is it that you need from me, because maybe it's important for me to have a hug and a kiss every morning and every night. And maybe for him, it's important for me to shut up while he's trying to have his coffee in the morning and he wants to have it in peace. But, you know, it's those little things, right? Yeah. And it annoys yeah. him that I, I wake up and it's like, yep, 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 yep. I, I had the dream about this and this and he just wants to be in peace. So he's already pissed off at me in the morning, perhaps, because, you know, so I think it's it's sometimes we don't voice those little things and maybe it's important to do so. Now, my yeah. husband didn't do this exercise, obviously. I, I knew he wouldn't. But maybe, Mark, maybe if you if you try it with your wife, Maybe you guys yeah. will have better luck, but it's it's also a good way to reconnect and to get to know each other better and to get to know Absolutely. each other again because our needs yeah. change and whatever your needs were 20 years ago, as far as your relationship goes, will be will be very different today. Absolutely. No, that's a great exercise, Lynn. Absolutely. So I, I would I would encourage you, Mark, to try this with your partner. Uh, because any way that you can get into a deeper awareness of one another, get into your hearts, uh, that will be so, so important to having a healthier sex life. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. 
Thank you guys so much for watching or listening, whichever platform you may be on. We appreciate the support you guys give us and the questions and the likes and the comments. Please make sure you share this with someone that you know so that we get it out there to as many people as possible. Dr. Lucille, always a pleasure. I always look forward to our podcast. I enjoy it so much. And guys, in the next episode, we're going to have, uh, we'll be hearing from Lo Laura, who's struggling after losing her husband and some conflicts with son, anxiety, relationship issues. So more, more of your questions will be addressed in the next issue. Thank you guys so much for listening and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Please be aware that Lynn and I are here to provide insights, advice, stories that are for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of our content should be considered to be personal, medical, or mental health therapy. If you are experiencing a mental health or physical health challenge, please consult the appropriate healthcare specialist. We are here to provide the best possible content in an atmosphere of positive conversation and personal growth.